Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our last, but certainly not least, artist talk as part of Artists of Hawaii Now. We're really thrilled to be able to have Linda Hess, Nancy Creedman, and Rick DeLeon here for this conversation to talk about Linda Hess's piece, A Thousand Flowers. So the Artists of Hawaii Now is in its final week of its public showing. It closes on January 16th, which is this Sunday. So we encourage everybody to take out, take, uh, check it out if you haven't already, our final weekend. And um, I'm just gonna share a little bit about Artists of Hawaii Now, uh, just to contextualize the exhibition for you before we dive deep into this uh, special piece. So Artists of Hawaii is a long-standing exhibition uh, for at the Honolulu Museum of Art that has been in existence since 1950. And this show was originally Artists of Hawaii 2020, and due to the pandemic, we had to postpone it a year. And all of the artists who were selected for this year's exhibition were grappling with issues that are relevant uh, for our time and place. And, you know, obviously Artists of Hawaii is a, um, it's, a it's for local artists, artists who are uh, live in Hawaii or who are born and raised in Hawaii. And uh, we're just incredibly honored to be able to have 18 uh, really ambitious, bold artists who are using a very vast array of mediums to express their, their voice and to tell these different stories of our time and place. And so Linda Hess is one of our 18 artists. Hi, Linda. <laughs> and her piece, A Thousand Flowers, is, uh, in one of our, is in our gallery space. And we're going to... Um, we're gonna show a video clip that talks a bit about the piece and Linda will, will be describing uh, the piece for you. But before we do that, I want to introduce the panelists here who have all been in dialogue with Linda as she was creating her, her piece. And so their work and their research has, um, you know, really directly influenced, um, you know, the, the piece and the, its expression and how um, Linda has been interpreting uh, the meaning of her work. So first we have Nancy Creedman who is the Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of the Domestic Violence Action Center. And she was formerly the Domestic Violence uh, Clear Clearing House and Legal Hotline, which was formerly the domestic, the domestic Violence Clearing House and Legal Hotline. As she has been working with local and national efforts to address family violence issues for more than 35 years. Nancy has served on many committees in the community and through appointment by the governor, chief justice, mayor, and attorney general, including the Hawaii State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, Hawaii State Commission on the Status of Women, Access to Justice Commission, and Hawaii Children's Trust Fund. The Domestic Violence Action Center is the leading voice in the community, keeping violence against women as a priority issue for discourse, public policy, community planning, resource allocation, system reform, and community awareness. Nancy conducts training for many audiences, including healthcare, faith-based, legal, academic, and business sectors. We're very honored to have Nancy Creedman here with it's us. My pleasure. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. We also have Rick DeLeon, uh, Dr. Rick DeLeon, who is a licensed clinical social worker with over 35 years of experience in providing direct clinical services and leading community-based intervention programs. Since retiring from the military in, 20, uh, in uh, uh, 2007, he worked in a variety of settings, including civil service as, a, and the, as a, a clinician and program director in private practice and advocacy and consultation service. He currently serves as the family advocacy program director for US Army Garrison Hawaii, providing a wide spectrum of education and prevention programs for domestic violence, including new parent support services, victim advocacy, and community awareness programs. His current focus area is on creating pathways to shift current societal norms around entrenched notions of masculine feminine traits as gender-based dichotomies. Um, we're, thank you so much, Rick, for joining us and being in conversation with Linda as well. Um, we're gonna actually sort of bring you back towards the end of the conversation when we talk about uh, domestic violence within a military context. Um, so, but, but thank you so much for being with us and, and we can really look forward to, um, to dive into this conversation with you. Sure, my pleasure, thank you. All right, so now we're gonna show the video clip uh, for Linda Hess's piece. 
Every flower is unique and molded by hand. That's a really important part. Every woman is unique. How they adapt to their circumstances is a unique expression. I was explaining this to my daughter the other day. So like in your dreams, the symbolism comes up, but you also have your own experience. So each person's gonna have a different interpretation of those experiences. And I think the power of art is to be able to reach everyone across different experiences. This society, whether we personally experience the violence or not against ourselves as women, it's there. You know, it's the background that we live our lives. Flowers are often a symbol for women for sort of obvious visual reasons, but we also use them for memorial. We use flowers for, you know, celebration. You know, it's interesting how flowers are connected in our society, and I just wanted to bring all of that in. So now I'm going to pass the mic to Linda Hess herself to just share a little bit about her work. We're going to show a slideshow of some images of her piece. Um, so Linda, yeah, if you could share a little bit more about your piece, what inspired it, what was some of the intentions behind it, and to kind of contextualize some of the images we're going to see together. Okay, well, about three and a half years ago, I picked up some clay. I had been a painter, but I had gone to Paliku Art Festival and they gave us some clay to take home and play with. And that's pretty much how this started. I just was playing around with the clay and I came up with a form that was fl a flower form. And I thought this could be used in what I've had as a theme for multiple decades, which is issues from women and about women. And I thought this is a great metaphorical way to talk about women with using a flower. I think Christine's gonna show us the picture. Yes, this is in the air. Then you can just, maybe you can go back just one. Um, anyway, in the end, a voice told me I should make a thousand flowers like a thousand cranes, become a memorial for women, become a, uh, a goal for healing women and the violence against women. And I love this photograph who my friend Tia Wu took with her daughters because it shows how um, the installation is approached. These uh, two beautiful women are coming out of the installation. So you can see that you go into a separate room which the curtain closes and you're isolated with the flowers all around you all over the ceiling you know, over the door. And the, another part, important part of the exhibition is represented by the woman outside at the table. And that is uh, the witness book, which is the public participation, I'm gonna hold it up here, where people, women can write their stories. A lot of women don't get to talk about what happened to them or don't, aren't believed if they do. And so we wanted that, I wanted them to be able to express themselves and get some, support from other people in the community that they could read through these and they could witness those. You can do the next slide, thank you. So once you go in, there's a ring of, of candle-like lights. Uh, they're not quite as white as they're seen here. They're like flickering flames and that's to me evocative of a lot of things. They encircle you. Someone in the book wrote that it was very, like a seance. I think of it as like uh, eternity, the circle, lots of metaphors in here. Uh, the general metaphor I have, the flowers being the women against the red background, which uh, talks about the violence against women that permeates our culture. Next. Um, this was from how I was making a thousand flowers. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was a very long project. It took a long time. Next. And these are, we're just, I, we can go through these a little bit quickly. These are some of the things that people have left in the book. Uh, some notes. I want to, if you get, go past, okay. 
a lot of the, this is a beautiful one to me because this is sort of encapsulates what I wanted to have happen with the book. I told him to stop, but he wouldn't listen. And then another viewer wrote, you are not alone. She witnessed that. She believes her. And I think that's very important when we talk about this topic. You can go forward. I think there are a couple more. I was very impressed with how many very, very supportive uh, comments were in there, even if I couldn't read them all. Yes, and we had some, we had about 10 different languages. So uh, just gives you an idea of how worldwide this problem really is. And then uh, that was it. I, and I have to say, you know, just sort of observing uh, audiences, different audiences engage with the piece over the past several months. Um, I've noticed so many people be like quite emotionally moved by it. You know, they will enter and then sort of leave that space um, with a slightly different, like there was a slightly different air to them. And in a lot of cases, um, the feedback has included, you know, just feeling really safe in that space and feeling not alone. And um, so thank you, Linda, for creating the piece that you created and for creating that space for so many, so many people. You're welcome. I really wanted it to be a very healing space. And I think sometimes just, it's a little bit of a dichotomy because when you're in there, you're surrounded and you're alone. But when you see everything that's going on in, on in there, you know that you're not alone and that itself can be very healing. So now I'm going to um, invite Nancy Creedman to share uh, to share about her work in that, you know, Linda um, was heavily inspired by Domestic Violence Action Center and the work that Nancy does. And I'm wondering if maybe, Linda, if you wouldn't mind just sort of sharing um, or introducing Nancy or just sharing a little bit about what, it, what, um, what inspired you to reach out to Nancy in, in collaborating with her for this piece. Well, I remember when it was domestic violence, clearing house and legal hotline. Uh, we've been working here and there together through a mutual friend, Kimberlyn Blackburn. She's often done artist shows, art shows that will raise money, do fundraising for Nancy's group. And she and Nancy go way back. So I feel like, you know, we're just part of that circle. <laughs> And it's a lot of work to do an art show, a fundraising art show. So we haven't done that for a while, but I hope they will come back. We do too. It, I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have allies uh, throughout the community. Um, being approached uh, by Linda and the museum uh, several years ago with the idea and giving birth to the installation and the uh, uh, exhibit and the way that the Domestic Violence Action Center could use our voice to contribute to Linda's exquisite installation uh, is very, very important for us. Um, we have long realized that the problem of domestic violence um, is something that we can't address alone without allies in all sectors, artists, musicians, attorneys, elected leaders, uh, clergy, uh, businesses, uh, we need the community to understand in a very, very real way that domestic violence does not discriminate. As Linda is pointing out, the uh, comments in the installation book were in 10 languages. I was there uh, several times uh, since it's been installed. And um, you could see that the comments were increasing over time and that people were very moved by uh, what they saw and how it resonated likely with their own experiences, whether they themselves have experienced um, a form of violence. Honestly, I'm one of the few women I know who hasn't been a victim of violence, sexual violence, childhood violence, or partner violence. Almost everybody I know has experienced a form of abuse. So um, it is an issue that we as a community have to um, face in a very, very real way. So to have Linda's expression and the opportunity for everybody who visits the Honolulu Museum of Art to see what Linda has done and to connect it with us brings us one step closer to um, other survivors who may need us and haven't spoken uh, 
about it yet, or supporters who appreciate what we're doing in service to island families in the community. So I was very, very grateful when Linda said, I am going to create this installation and I would like to involve um, the Domestic Violence Action Center and some of the survivors that you work with. So Linda came to a couple of our events. This was pre-coronavirus and we had uh, support group participants uh, painting the uh, flowers. And we had uh, Linda come to a luncheon, mother-daughter luncheon, and invited the participants at Heart to Heart uh, paint flowers. So everybody uh, can be touched and can play a role. And that's uh, what we lean into as an organization that's in service to the community. Mm -hmm. Nancy, before, I, before you share maybe more of the statistical realities of domestic violence here in Hawaii, I, I just want to, I'm just curious, like when you first experienced Linda's piece, you know, in person, yeah. like just what were, what stuck out to you or just what was, yeah, what, what, what stuck out to you when you experienced the piece? Well, um, before I experienced the piece, I experienced the little flowers mm. and the uh, enormous uh, grace it took to create every single one of those flowers. Um, and I saw the way it was going to be installed and um, was described to me, but I didn't fully grasp it until I stood in that uh, room with the flowers and the lights and the privacy of um, the color and the silence and the truth, mm. which is what happens when you're in that room. So well said, yes. And um, actually, Linda, I have to ask, um, because Nancy, you mentioned just the, the, the grace of individual flowers. Um, so Linda, like, what was your approach to uh, the aesthetics of those flowers when you were making them? Or, you know, what, 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 were you, the, what were you sort of hoping to achieve when you were yourself, you know, creating these individual flowers? And um, what was sort of the thought process behind just how the aesthetically, how they, how they looked? And if you, I, know, I know you put so much thought into it, so I just want you to share a little bit more about that. Uh... Well, it's funny because I had never done clay or any kind of three-dimensional thing before. So I'm, I mean, I was a painter. You can see some of my paintings behind me, but um, yeah. So I approached it like a painter and I wanted to just, I wanted the clay to be what uh, express what I had in my head aesthetically. I wanted it to be very white. I wanted to have that red edge as a particular way that maybe sometimes it felt like blood that was dripping and I, I just worked with a lot of different things until I could find the combination I couldn't find a glaze or an underglaze that would do that and again at that point I'm still learning what clay is all about you know so but I really felt when I was making all these flowers and you start with a ball and you really rub it and you turn it into a vessel and then you kind of spread it out and squish it into a flower shape. Then I would slice the bottom off because I didn't want the women to be seen as a vessel. I don't, I think that's a very old trope that I think I that the culture thought that the man planted the seed in the woman, therefore the woman was the vessel. The woman wasn't half of it biologically. She was just the soil, which is um, just not what I think is really the important part here. I think the important part is the part of the woman that expands and can do anything and can get this enormous baby out of her <laughs> and still recover to do it again another day. I mean, just the, it showed me the resilience of women, the image of the flower. And I wanted that, I thought that was very important. Mm. So I, I know we're kind of gonna go deeper into maybe just like unpacking kind of the, the intentions behind the flowers and, and, and how you went about it. But I, I, I do want Nancy, cause I know this was really important to you, Linda. Um, if you could share Nancy, just a little bit about um, some of just the statistics and the realities of domestic violence in our home and here in Hawaii, just so that, um, you know, 
folks who are listening or, or watching this can um, have a sense of the scale of the issue that maybe goes unseen. Right. Yeah. I just want to say uh, in response to um, Linda's observation about the resilience of women that uh, what we see at the Domestic Violence Action Center uh, in terms of every survivor that we serve, the level of resilience that she demonstrates every step of the way is um, in, a, in, in one sense astonishing and in another sense, uh, captivating uh, for the power. People think of uh, victims of domestic violence as weak or helpless. Uh, that's really not a fair or accurate characterization. Uh, women who survive domestic violence are uh, powerful and resilient, overcoming barriers and obstacles that most people uh, wouldn't really be able to grasp. Um, so the problem is a big one. Um, it does not discriminate. We see uh, survivors from every ethnic community, every socioeconomic class, uh, religion, uh, profession, educational level, the community. Um, it's easy and it convenient for the community to say, well, this only happens to you know, low income brown people in Palolo. It's a way of distancing oneself from its truth, which is this is happening to people that I know, that you know, that we all know. And uh, we may not know that we know because there's still a lot of shame associated with the problem of domestic violence because the community um, blames victims for the position that they find themselves in, or somehow maybe they're responsible for provoking it or not leaving when it happens or not leaving fast enough or staying or breaking up the family. There's a multitude of things that victims are blamed for. So people keep it a secret. Since the pandemic, uh, when the first stay at home uh, and um, safer at home directives were delivered by the governor, we were very frightened for uh, survivors who were going to become prisoners of their partners behind closed doors. And we uh, were concerned that they would not be able to make a telephone call because if somebody is standing beside you or in the next room or tracking your conversations, you're unable to ask questions, uh, make calls, ask for help. So we added text and chat features to our communication systems so that um, if they needed to reach out and get some information or be the benefactor, the beneficiary rather of a safety plan, they would be able to um, text us or chat with us. And I want to say that since April 1st of 2020, um, the staff at the Domestic Violence Action Center, although we began as a very small organization with two part-time staff, there are now 50 of us working in a variety of different kinds of programs. Um, our staff had um, more than 59,000 contacts with the clients on our caseload. So these are not the helpline calls or the texts and the chats from people who were first learning that we existed and that we were here to help. These were people who were lucky enough to find us and uh, were already working with somebody on staff. We were concerned about their safety. And so we encourage our staff to make frequent contact with them. And they surely did. 59,000 contacts with clients. With uh, those same clients, we completed, um, let's see, I want to tell you, uh, 13, almost 14,000 safety plans. A safety plan is uh, a, a way for a person to think about the moment they find themselves in danger. When you're in crisis, it's very hard to make a decision about should I do this or should I do that? Where should I go? Who should I call? What should I take with me? Should I go now? Should I go in 15 minutes? Should I sneak out? Should I just boldly walk out? Um, if you've had the benefit of a conversation with somebody, you can make all those decisions in advance. And when you're in crisis, you can say, you know what, I'm gonna go. I've got my bag packed, it's in uh, the back seat of my car. I've got 20 bucks in my pocket. I've got a spare set of car keys, whatever it is. Um, there are, um, in those families that we helped, there were more than 33,000 children. So again, we're talking about large numbers, just as one agency, in a, a period of time. Now we know this is 
an underreported crime. And I think some of the comments in the uh, installation book reflected the fact that people don't tell uh, others about their experience. Uh, I think some uh, of the comments were, I never told anybody this, this happened to me. And again, for good reason. But this is a problem that is complex, is costly, and has uh, life-altering, lifelong impacts. And uh, whether you're a business person or an artist or an elected leader or a child, uh, in some way, this touches your life. And uh, collectively, we have to um, take responsibility for addressing it. It's going to be in the best interest of all of us. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, that's, the statistics are pretty staggering. And um, and Linda, I, I want to ask, like, you know, when you hear those statistics and when you think about, you know, how your piece helps raise awareness of that, um, can you talk a little bit more about how your piece maybe reflects those, that theme of like this kind of hidden reality of domestic violence and sort of how you, how you approach that um, so that it could kind of, that could kind of also be reflected in your piece as well, if you could share about that. Mm. I think when I read through this, the uh, witness book, I find that it, it's different for different people. When you're an artist, when you're working with metaphor, you, you can't, each person is bringing to it their own experience. So you can't say, I'm doing this exactly for this response. It's not gonna ever happen as we've seen. No, no way ever is everybody gonna be on the same page about anything. I think if that's one thing we've taken away from this pandemic, it's that. <laughs> so I find some women were very triggered to remember things that maybe they didn't remember before being in there, some really felt like they felt not alone. Um, I find when I looked at the book, like there was a woman in the book who said that she was molested by her doctor when she was nine years old and she'd never told anyone because she didn't think anyone would ever believe her or she, they would turn it on her. And when I read that, it really touched me, but it also reminded me of my own experiences at the pediatrician when I was quite little and it wasn't anything to the degree of hers, but we had to, you know, there was, it was the 50s era, you know, huge furniture, huge house, floor to ceiling window. And the doctor made us, made me like take off my clothes down to my underwear and stand in front of this huge window. And, you know, I mean, my mother was always there, nothing happened, but I was sort of traumatized by that. I felt like I was being naked and people could see me, you know? So I wouldn't even have remembered that if I hadn't, this woman hadn't shared her experience. So I think there's a lot of this sort of like little connections being made, which I find very gratifying. And I think helps us all because I think we shunt a lot of that stuff into our bodies and hide it, hide it away and to bring it up is very important. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your decision to have a curtain in your piece and also your lighting decision, like how you lit the piece? Because I know that was also intricately tied to this idea of how to, this like the hidden nature of, of you know, domestic violence. Yeah, could you speak a little bit about that? Great. I think uh, a lot of this happened because the pandemic happened. I mean, a lot of things kind of evolved, which I think they would have evolved. They might not have evolved the same way. I remember my original feeling was that it would be sort of an alcove kind of feeling, a sort of sacred female space, something womb-like you know, that's dedicated to the feminine. And, and then when we got, when I got the first placement in the gallery, it was a corner. And that's when I came up with the eight by eight by eight foot cube. And I really was going to subtitle it Cornerstone because I felt like domestic violence and the subjugation of women is really the cornerstone of our society, whether we want to acknowledge that or not, you know, it exists. And it didn't, in the end, it had a couple different permutations. I kind of ended up close to the corner. I can't quite say it the way it was. But another thing that happened early on is uh, because of the eight by eight by eight cube, uh, the museum didn't want people to be able to reach out and touch the walls. And that defined the space where the person 
that only one, maybe two people could go in at a time and they had to be two feet from every wall that defined the space where people would stand, which led to the creation of the lights. And, you know, all of it kind of worked together. I remember when I first heard that, I was very disappointed. That was not sort of what I thought of conceptually. I thought that we would at some point just notice that this thing was over here that was so feminine and we would be drawn to it, you know, but then after the pandemic, it totally made sense that we would be isolated into these experiences. <laughs> and it, you know, even if you have an idea as an artist, you don't really know how it's going to manifest it, the emotion of it necessarily. You know, you don't control all these things. It's a process. So I think it just worked out that, you know, we had the cube, we had the way it would be entered. And then I was afraid without the curtain, there would be no privacy, that nobody would be really looking at the art, the flowers or the artwork because there was a huge movie right behind, you know, right on the other side of the door. There's, there's too many distractions in life. And so I really wanted it to be its own sort of thing that people experience together. But I think that made, I think, you know, that made a huge difference in the end. You know, I just want to add one, one thought. Uh, the thing that's so powerful about that uh, concept is that when you get into the curtained space, you can't look the other way. In real life and okay. in community, everybody is looking the other way. They don't want to see domestic violence unless they're forced to, unless somebody comes to them and discloses or they see bruises people are still making excuses or minimizing. And it's difficult to do that when uh, it's framed and shaped and designed and crafted with uh, the, the talent and the grace that Linda invested in, um, in the work. You can't look the other way. Thank you. Such a great thing. Yes. <laughs> And um, you know, Linda, I love how you mentioned that kind of dialogue between artists and an organization institution and how that actually like form informed the piece at the end of, you know, and 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 I want to kind of kind of talk a little bit, all of us together, about like the value of that kind of collaboration, um, you know, between artists and organizations or between organizations. Um, and so I guess to open-ended question for both Nancy and Linda, you know, like, what do you think is the value of community-based partnerships in addressing this issue? And, you know, what are there examples, are there good examples that we could follow? Are there, you know, not great examples or just like, how, how do you approach those type of partnerships, both in art and also in, you know, making a difference in the issue? Nancy, yeah. what are you? Yeah, um, well, community partnerships mean everything. Uh, to us. Uh, we try to seek every opportunity we can to join with others. I mean, there's a lot of intersections between issues and between challenges and between communities. And when we can create uh, allies and nurture allies, then we can lift uh, the truths more uh, successfully and we can lift our voice uh, more effectively. So the community collaborations and the community partnerships are um, a dream for us. Uh, we never um, decline an invitation to have a booth, make a presentation, uh, offer comments, uh, participate in media commentary, join with other professionals. It's, it's crucial. We can't uh, be isolated. Uh, the way domestic violence survivors are isolated, we have to raise the veil and raise the voice in order to um, help those who are unable to use their voice. So we see that as a very important role for us, is to collaborate with others who help um, elevate our voice and uh, project the voice of survivors and the voice of, of women who are subjugated and second-class citizens still today in 2022. I think for me, I think this exhibition is just the perfect example of the best of art being uh, community-based and activist 
in a certain way and all the different permutations that means. I hope everybody will have seen the show or will see the show this weekend. There's only four more days for it to be up. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about there covers such a range of important issues for our community, the homelessness, uh, environmentalism, uh, culture. I can't even tell you, you really, everyone should see this and see how the different artists are working to present these ideas in aesthetic ways that maybe can reach people on a different level. I just wanted to, I don't know whether I'm speaking out of turn here or not, but if there are uh, uh, viewers or guests who have questions or would like to join the conversation, if it's okay, I would love to invite them to do that. Yes, absolutely. Um, for those who are listening, feel free to just you know type a question in the chat or um, there's a Q&A function at the bottom and you can just submit, submit a question live and we can answer it. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for inviting that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I know this is something that came up in sort of our conversations earlier, but like what type of collaborations work and what type of collaborations don't work? Like, our, you know, when we dive deeper into like, what does it mean for artists to collaborate with grassroots organizations and um, or for artists to collaborate with like, you know, institutions such as the museum, you know, yeah, what are examples of good and bad collaboration? When does it not work? That's yours, Nancy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> oh, I didn't realize that. Um, collaborations uh, work best, I think, when uh, people are able to step into one another's uh, shoes, uh, listen to each other's experience, and craft uh, the collaboration so that's a reflection of uh, all the entities. I mean, we've been in conversation, uh, the three of us and others, for more than two years, uh, developing uh, and uh, driving us to this moment. And we've explored a bunch of different things. We've experimented with a bunch of different things. And I think that's what a collaboration uh, entails. There's no way to go into a collaboration as though it's just one person or one entity or one system or one talent. Uh, Linda brings uh, talent to uh, the collaboration as does the Domestic Violence Action Center. And that's what makes it beautiful is that we're able to inform the work and she's able to uh, interpret the work. So that's what, uh, that's what makes it happen. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Nancy. And I, actually, we have a really good question in chat. If this is okay, I'm going to read it um, from Kathy. Uh, it seems that the core message of the art piece is that you are not alone. Is this communicated to the viewer in other ways besides the use of the journal? I think that's maybe for Linda. Yeah, sure. I think that going by my uh, reading of some of the things in the journal is that people, when they're in there, they don't feel alone. So when they're in there, when they know that these flowers represent other people who have gone through similar things, they do feel quite supported. And, you know, so I think that the answer is yes. Was that the I question? Think, I think one way uh, it um, enhances the message is by the museum's willingness and selection of the installation and um, the ways in which uh, anybody who's a visitor to the museum can be introduced to the topic, the artwork, and the voices of, of other people. And then uh, that's the nature of um, community mobilization is that I go to an exhibit and then I share my experience with my uh, coworkers or my family or my friends and encourage them to go to the Honolulu Museum of Art and experience the installation. So that's another way that we break down the isolation and uh, increase um, the ways in which uh, the community can see this as an issue that they must take uh, seriously. 
And actually, thank you, Nancy. And, and um, the other element of the piece is the title itself that comes to my mind. And I'm wondering if, um, Linda, you could comment a little bit about uh, why a thousand flowers? Like why, yeah, that kind of that, that, that number in particular, which at least for me kind of answers the question of, of, of um, one way that the piece communicates, you know, not being alone, that there's, there's uh, that kind of being surrounded by so many um, uh, examples of, of surviving domestic violence. But I, yeah, if, if you could share a little bit about the background of the title, Linda. Right. Um, so basically, and I think in Hawaii, we're pre all kind of familiar with the colloquially the thousand flowers, the thousand cranes. Uh, that when I looked into the actual story, there is a very old Japanese story that it was based on, but it was revived in contemporary times by a, a young girl who was a victim of the nuclear bombs. And as she was dying, she was folding the cranes, thinking that they would help to heal her. And she did not live to complete the cranes, but other people took it upon them to do that. And so that's been a big part of that. So to me, that emphasized healing memorial, our wishes for the future, our, you know, our, our wanting to heal the past. And it was just, I think it's sort of a loaded number in that way. I really want to get to to what Rick has to say. Can we? Get yeah, to Rick? yeah, perfect, <laughs> perfect timing. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So now we're gonna invite Rick DeLeon back um, on this screen um, because his research and work um, has definitely been an influence in 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 Linda's sort of process, creative process. So, um, Rick, if if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about the work that you do, and um, and yeah, we will have some questions for us all together. Sure, thank you. And um, you're tracking on audio, I guess. So, okay, good, good. Um, first of all, uh, I want to just thank everybody that's involved with this because I think it's a uh, particularly important um, reality check that we have in our community at this time. I mean, it's always been um, a significant concern in the community, the, the whole notion of domestic violence and uh, awareness of it, just like uh, variations on child abuse and uh, especially sexual child abuse. Up until fairly recently, it, it, we just don't talk about it. And I, I love the uh, notion of um, the symbolism of being behind the curtain and, and it's a it, it hidden place on the, on the negative side where we have to keep this a secret and society does not want to hear it. So uh, stories get count, discounted or ignored or even worse, we um, even today, um, one of our clients came in and it was uh, the a child abuse case where the uh, father was convicted, he was a perpetrator and the mother was blaming the child. And so, uh, because, and, and that's not a unique or uncommon thing and that's what's so tragic. And so that's kind of the dark and negative side of that uh, lonely space of being in there. And then I really loved the way that this represents the work I'm trying to do is to flip that whole uh, cultural script about ignoring, discounting, um, pretending it's not there. And so the room can also, if we look at it from the right perspective, as was discussed, uh, represent a safe place, a place of healing, a place of collaboration and, and unity and, and recognizing that we're not alone. And part of the discussions I thought was uh, interesting in working with um, Linda uh, leading up to this uh, was just the extemporaneous notion of, well, do we really think we wanna have a man there? you know, to, to speak and everything. And, and, and that uh, was something played out. And I thought that that was an excellent point because that really um, speaks to how entrenched a lot of the beliefs out there are that uh, one of the things I wanted to comment on is that, you know, men are the perpetrators and um, it, it runs the gamut across the, our community, uh, same sex folks, uh, have very similar rates of domestic violence, uh, women, uh, women on children and, and uh, teens, 
next month, in fact, is uh, Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month coming up. So there's just, it, it runs such a broad spectrum. And so um, I wanted to, if, if okay, one of the thoughts that came to mind for me was talking about it and this is where it ties to the research from a man's perspective in the sense of my anecdotal experience, uh, because that, that's what launched me into this whole interest in what is, because uh, what is the notion of toxic masculinity that started the conversation I had with Linda originally, because that was kind of the theme, what's toxic masculinity, how is that playing out? And that was how I started uh, my original research in this was uh, a very naive look at, okay, what is this thing, toxic masculinity? And it turned into a very deep dive and really um, helped unfold an appreciation for the need to redefine the whole notion of um, what gets focused on in terms of toxic masculinity versus femininity and the dichotomy that um, it's either or, all or nothing, good or bad. And, and that is a very common default in society is to get uh, to, to assume things are black and white. And the reality is that it, it is not a gender driven process, the whole notion of masculinity or femininity um, with the undertones of toxic masculinity equals domestic violence. That, that's kind of the, the underlying message that gets played out. And the reality is that um, femininity and, and masculinity is actually a human trait. It runs the spectrum. It's not an either or thing. Um, cultures and societies have their preferences for what um, is more considered more attractive either on the masculine or feminine side. Um, and so that gets mistaken as a gender defined notion. And, and we see this playing out in a very good way with uh, a lot of recognition for the rights of LGBTQ communities and, and same sex um, uh, relationships and everything that has come a long way in the last few years of getting more mainstreamed and becoming part of the discussion. And so from the research and, and my personal experience, I grew up in a household that was, my, my father was a uh, immigrant to this country, very, very, from a, his, his uh, Latin American uh, society, very entrenched and you, you must be masculine. And if you even question the fact that you need to be masculine, I'll kick your ass. Your ass. And so <laughs> that was kind of the uh, underlying assumption. So. Uh, I grew up with big dogs to be tough with, he had lots of guns. Um, if you get in a fight or somebody insults you, you beat them up. So everything was um, socialized around power and control and dominance and mastery. And that was the underlying message for us as, as young male children in the household. And this is very, very common across you know our, our whole country. Uh, and society as a whole. And what wound up happening was it didn't feel right for me. It was, it was like, but there's so much more. There's so much more to the human experience. And so that was kind of the introduction. So what did I do growing up? I, I joined the military. I became an officer in the military. I got a black belt in martial arts. I became an extra, expert shooter. I became a surfer, I became an athlete, all these things that were stereotypically masculine. And a lot of it I enjoyed and a lot of it felt very um, incongruous with the real message of what is a, a healthy human? What, what makes us in our fullest capacity as human beings uh, holistically well? And the common cultural norms around what that means for men is that you can, of this broad, broad range of emotional context that we as humans can experience, men oftentimes, and this was a lot of the discussion in the research, was uh, felt very, very clearly the vast, vast majority of men I interviewed 
um, felt very constrained to being okay to express maybe one or two emotions. Anger was one. Anger is always okay. So that's good because that, that means you're tough and you're a man and you're masculine. And happiness was another one. But if you start showing any um, indications of uh, questioning something in terms of I don't know what's going on or fear or a lack of mastery over a situation, um, that becomes uh, for many men internalized as a real negative referent that I'm weak. I'm not adequate, I'm not good enough. So it becomes this whole journey for many men to provide and present a tough exterior. And this, this is where it really hit home in, in just about every participant in the study uh, that they had this outward image that they, they felt compelled and um, in absolute demand to show up at, as this strong, confident, tough person in whatever way that meant for them. It, it, it came out in several different main threads, but inside every one of them felt incomplete. And, and I, was, I was blessed in the way that the discussions were set up that it unfolded so that a lot of these guys would actually put their guard down and talk and, 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 and engage. A lot of them were military, so I had that already um, established credibility uh, assumed by them. And so once we got to the core point that the reality was they felt inadequate and compelled to continue this exterior um, representation right. of themselves, and yet the more that they felt and they did that and felt inadequate because they never could meet that impossible hypermasculine image, uh, the less adequate they felt internally. Right. And so where does that come out? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I this is what you're saying, like really, um, really important points in terms of, you know, yeah, this toxic masculinity and how it's perpetuated. And, and I kind of want to uh, ping it back to Linda. Linda, if you yeah. wouldn't mind, like, because I'm curious, you know, as, you know, Rick is sharing, um, you know, a thought came to mind is like, you know, how, when, how do you maybe see, or what was, do you have, what were the intentions behind your piece, maybe, you know, influencing a perpetrator who might have walked or experienced, walked into your piece or experienced it, or, 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 or men who are very hyper-masculine, um, entering your piece, like what, how, how did you, um, what was your intentions behind maybe those types of experiences? Gosh, I'm not sure I really thought about it in, in that many words. <laughs> I can tell you that once I was in the gallery just randomly and a couple was coming out of the piece and I thought, oh, well, maybe that wasn't what I had in mind, that I wanted a woman to experience that on her own and maybe her being with this, with this partner of hers, maybe mm. that give her the opportunity to have the experience that I was thinking you know uh, I took uh, there were some older men I was with they just didn't quite kind of get it you know so like I said I can't sort of determine other people's experiences I would hope that it can reach people because to me it has a a certain vibration to it whether that maybe made people uncomfortable that's another mm. option. I think it was so interesting when I was studying more about this that we talked about all, uh, I was reading about all the different groups that have been, had violence perpetuated on them, you know, women, LGBTQ, men who showed feminine traits, uh, children, whatever it is. And it just kind of left me like, there's all this huge broad spectrum of victims but there must be also then a, a much smaller cohort of people perpetrating that violence. And that's really what I wanted to, you know, talk to Rick about. I also imagine that there's some overlap that the people perpetrating the violence are the people who had violence perpetrated on themselves. Right. And actually, Nancy, do you find that in your work that often perpetrators experience some type of you know domestic violence themselves or I, yeah 
Um, I, I just wanted to say one thing before I answer that question, yes. and that is yeah. um, in relation to Linda's description of seeing a man and a woman come out of the, the piece, yes. uh, we very much see men as allies, that this is not work we can do alone. Again, as, I, you know, as we've been talking for the, um, since we joined, uh, this is a community-wide issue, and people in many different facets of community life, including men, uh, are part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And so it might have been a really uh, powerful experience for that man to be with uh, his partner or sister uh, or friend and hear from her what it was like, or for mm -hmm. them to explore together what the experience of sharing uh, that um, private moment behind the curtain was like. Um, so I just kind of wanted to say and lift up that, that we see you know, men as allies. Um, yes, I want to say that there are uh, the vast majority of men who become perpetrators have uh, had some experience with trauma themselves as children, largely, either as witnesses uh, to violence in their household or as direct victims yeah. of uh, childhood abuse or childhood sexual abuse. And um, the, the sense is uh, they will never be in a position again where they are vulnerable, victimized, and they will have command over others, mm -hmm. which lays the foundation for uh, their perpetration of power and control over a partner or their children. I also want to reinforce one other thing that Rick said, and that is that the social norms that uh, govern our uh, interpersonal relations, our economics, our uh, uh, political arena uh, teach us that men have a certain uh, range of uh, experiences that they can have and traits that they can possess, strong, tough, brave, in charge. And women have very different ones, nurturing, compassionate, patient. It's a recipe for disaster when you're experimenting or entering into a dating and mating. Uh, mm -hmm. She has no power, he has all the power, and he starts wielding that power over her. And particularly if he's been a victim himself, he's not gonna let that happen to him. He's not gonna let her take advantage of him. Now, this is all his self-talk and possibly grow, and, uh, grows out of his experience. Um, not all men have been uh, traumatized, but many have. Mm. You know, this kind of leads us into, oh, Linda, were you going to say something? That's okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, oh, gosh, now I'm going to, what you, you were just, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, my brain froze. But in the witness yeah. book, I found often that, people were quite aware in overcoming this PTSD from these things. You know, I feel like the whole culture is getting, people were very unwilling to trust other people on both sides. You know, people were afraid to open up to the opposite sex because of what had happened or what they've seen or what was, what's been entrenched. And I find that very sad. I find that that's what re we really need to heal. Mm -hmm. What are, this is an open-ended question for everybody, sort of as we kind of nearing the final chapter of, of our time together, um, but what are the key action steps for victims or perpetrators? Um, what, are, what are some of the key solutions that you see working in, in the work that you do? You wanna start, Rick? Sure, yeah, I think because I probably um, see it from a little bit different perspective and, and the work that we're doing is of course with that hypermasculine culture of the military. And so we have actually a unique advantage in that uh, as compared to the civilian community, uh, our perpetrators can be ordered into treatment. And uh, I know judges and other folks can do that on the civilian side. However, it isn't as um, embedded in the impact on their career, their livelihood, their image as it is in the military. So we're trained to follow orders. And uh, so that's a leveraging advantage that we have just to get them in the door. And then um, that's where I think the collaboration I was gonna circle back to on was that it's, it's working with organizations like yours, Nancy, Nancy. And, 
thank you very much because our team uh, works extensively with yours and they have nothing but great things to say. And, and that's the kind of uh, impact that, as was mentioned earlier, we need to work collaboratively, collaboratively toward. But with the men that come in and, and go through the program, I think the indications are we have, a, with the limited ability to measure successful outcomes, uh, depending on how you measure that, uh, indicators are that there's a higher positive response. There's a, a higher level of um, awareness and actually internalizing some ins insights from the programs um, than I've seen in other settings. Uh, I think largely, largely because they know their motivation might be external, but they know if I don't get this right, my career is over a lot of times. And then we do have the outliers where um, they're not going to change their internal uh, worldview about the disparate uh, power between men and women. And they usually wind up losing a career or getting out. Uh, but that's uh, been the experience. And, and, and one final short piece is just the work I'm trying to do is to normalize uh, one of the key uh, barricades and blocks that prevents men from making shifts, which is help seeking behaviors. It's acknowledging that, hey, I'm in over my head. This is bigger than me, whether it's my emotions, not knowing how to manage a relationship, how do I parent or father these kids, and the fear that by raising my hand and saying, I can't do this, I need help, somehow I'm gonna be seen as weak. And, and we're changing that script to no, actually the opposite is 100% true, that it takes courage to step up, especially in our society, which says, if you ask for help, you're weak. And the reality is just the opposite. So we're really trying to find ways to embed that message across the community, both at the individual and the public messaging levels. And that is what I have to say for the moment. Thank you. Nancy. Yeah, I guess I would add uh, two, two or three other thoughts. One is if you are a survivor and you've uh, been with us this evening, know that there is help in the community. Yes. And if you uh, contact the Domestic Violence Action Center, either by telephone, by text, or by chat, it is confidential and um, anonymous, and uh, you get to make the decision that's right for you. We don't tell anybody what to do. We give people information and they decide what works for them and how they're going to um, make decisions that are in service to them and their, um, and their families. If you are a community ally or um, a museum supporter, uh, and you think you have a friend who might be suffering the harm of abuse, Listen with an open heart, uh, be patient, uh, show compassion, and understand that not everybody does the same thing given a challenge. What I might do in a given situation might be completely different than what you would do, Taylor. And that all I can do is stand by you and continue to stand by you as you wrestle with your options, your choices, and your barriers. So uh, we want the community to join us on the journey. Um, in your community, in your co work with your coworkers, in your business, in your leadership capacity. If you're a male leader or a female leader, make your work environment a place where people feel safe and free to talk about uh, domestic violence or the harm that they're experiencing or the harm that they're perpetrating uh, and help guide people uh, to the resources that uh, we as a community have developed uh, with the uh, specific devotion to addressing domestic violence. Yeah, Linda, before we kind of go to you, and I think you could maybe give like your our closing sort of you know thoughts on on next. So I definitely want to take a moment to share some of the links for the Domestic Violence Action Center resources. So if we could pull that up, and then if Nancy, if you could just sort of contextualize what we're looking at. Yeah. So uh, we have a you know website, of course, um, and uh, it's on, on your screen. Uh, you can go to our website and um, take as much time as you need to gain some understanding of what programs are available, what kinds of uh, services you might benefit from, 
the ways in which uh, you can uh, read something, think about it, come back to it, send us a text, send us a chat, give a phone, make a phone call. Um, if you want to become a volunteer, you can acquaint yourself with uh, the programs that we are um, offering to the community and we will train you to become a volunteer. We host events throughout the year um, to keep our program and our organization uh, thriving. You could uh, participate by purchasing some uh, specially designed products or making a contribution. Uh, you can take as much time as you want, visit the website as many times as you like. And certainly if you need help, uh, you're welcome to um, call us. Our staff are well-trained, well-supervised, and we um, consider ourselves the experts in domestic violence. Thank you, this is awesome. And yeah, we're looking at just the webpage right now with different um, reports and uh, contact information for folks to reference. Um, I think we have one more slide up here too. Yeah. So is this maybe an upcoming fundraiser that you're having? Yeah. Well, um, yes, February, of course, is uh, not only Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, it's also Valentine's Day. And we promote safe love and uh, provide an opportunity for the community to buy beautiful orchid plants um, to give to coworkers, loved ones, family members, and support the important work of the Domestic Violence Action Center. You can become a part of the work uh, by supporting our work. It's called Let Love Bloom. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Linda, yeah, what are, what, are, what are your thoughts in terms of, you know, how would you like audiences, uh, people who have experienced your piece or people who will soon experience your piece, um, how, how would you want people to walk away from it? And what are the steps that you would like people to, uh, to take? Well, I, hmm, that's a really great question. I want to say that I'm just, the one thing I really, I mean, a lot of things, we had very ambitious plans in the beginning of this before COVID shut everything down. And the one thing I really was clinging to was this evening with Nancy and with Rick and talking about these issues in a public way. And that, for that, I'm so grateful to everyone for making this happen. Uh, Nancy, Rick, you've given great ideas for everybody. I think everybody now, a lot of people who wrote in the memory book are like, what can I do? You know, you've given great ideas for that. Um, I don't know how much I have to add to that. I've been working since I started painting practically on different aspects, different women's issues. And this particular installation, this particular project has made me realize that the issues are really not unrelated. There's really a systemic uh, problem that we all need to solve. And I think that in our, in our country, in our world right now, these systems are starting to be revealed as like the flaws of them. I almost feel like there's been a concerted effort not only against women, but against the feminine in general and until we can sort of reclaim the feminine and bring the value of the feminine up to what it deserves, we're really not going to see much improvement in our, our life and we may not survive. I feel like we're at the end of like the ultimate place where this very masculine based culture has gotten us with the destruction of mother earth, with the, all of the masculine anger and the violence and you know, I think those systems are breaking down and I think just care of that and trying to stay positive. But I think this issue kind of pulls it all together. This issue is so multifaceted, like we could spend like the rest of our lives talking about different permutations of this. So I think for just take from it what, what sort of like triggered or tickled in your brain and pursue that a little bit. And I'll feel like I've done my job. <laughs> well, you've definitely done this a remarkable job, Linda, and very honored to be in conversation with Nancy and Rick tonight. And just really thank you all so much for your time. And thank you for those who are tuning in. 
we really appreciate you. Um, I hope we hope that this conversation sparks some some kind of inspiration or thought provoking um, ideas. And again, we encourage everybody to see the show if you haven't already. It closes on Sunday, January sixteenth. Um, thank you all so much, um, and have a beautiful rest of your evening and the rest of your week. Thank you, Jenna and Christine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate the opportunity and great, great to have the conversation. Thank you so much.